Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct pleasure to uh, welcome you to this evening's lecture, the annual Mackenzie Stewart Lecture of the Centre for European Legal Studies. Uh, I'm Kenneth Armstrong. I have the, the double honour of holding the chair in European law here in the faculty and being director of the, the Centre for European uh, Legal Studies, which in 2017 is celebrating its 25th uh, anniversary. The Mackenzie Stewart Lecture is named in honour of the first uh, judge from the United Kingdom to be appointed to the European Court of Justice following the UK's accession to the then European Economic Community in 1973. Jack Mackenzie Stewart later became the president of that court. And tonight's lecture is the 20th to be delivered. And I'm delighted that we will be able to welcome tonight Pascal Lamé to give uh, this year's lecture. Like the other speakers in the series, uh, Pascal Lamé has made an enormous contribution to public life. As you will all know, he served as an EU Trade Commissioner and as Director General of the World Trade Organization. Uh, but Pascal Lamé is also someone who thinks and reflects deeply on what and who trade liberal liberalization is for. And very helpfully, he puts his thoughts on paper. Now, his topic for tonight's lecture is is globalization faltering? And it could hardly be more timely. And so is his book. The Geneva Consensus, published by uh, Cambridge University Press back in 2013. And in that book, Pascal de defines globalization as a historic expansion of market capitalism and a fundamental transformation of society largely driven by ongoing technological revolution. But it's his most recent book, Où va le monde? Where's the world going? Where he shifts focus somewhat from the consensus to the, the apparent disorder that seems to be accompanying globalization and its distribution of winners and losers. The importance of this discussion could hardly be more be hardly be clearer or more resonant following the results of the UK's referendum, which will see the United Kingdom withdrawing from the European Union. But Brexit is but one dramatisation of the issues that preoccupy, preoccupy Pascal Lamy. And tonight we'll be invited to confront the question, is globalisation faltering? And it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Pascal to give this evening's 2017 Mackenzie Stewart Lecture. Pascal. Well, good evening. Uh, thanks for this uh, introduction. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's uh, an honor for me uh, to have been invited uh, for this uh, annual uh, Mackenzie Stewart Lecture. I happened uh, to have had the privilege of uh, working with Lord Mackenzie Stewart at the time when uh, I was uh, Chief of Staff uh, to Jacques Delors, which was a position I held between uh, 85 and 94. Part of this <laughs> coincides uh, with the uh, mandate of uh, late uh, Mackenzie uh, Stewart. It's also an honor, uh, because as you just said, you are celebrating uh, the 25th anniversary of uh, this uh, Center for European Legal Studies, uh, which in 2017 uh, may be a bit of a paradox, uh, because this uh, year is the year uh, where history uh, will say uh, was the year when uh, the Article 50 was triggered and the uh, Brexit uh, process started. And, and you 
already kindly hinted at that, uh, as I'm uh, well known for being among those who regret this uh, vote, I thought it might not be uh, academically correct, uh, given my total lack of objectivity, uh, to address this uh, Brexit issue up front this year, which is why I retweeted to a uh, somehow, although, and I'll come back to that in a minute, less contentious issue, uh, which is uh, globalization. Now, why are these two issues uh, uh, closely connected in my uh, mind uh, is uh, obvious. Uh, it's because European integration and globalization have been uh, the two big uh, major transformations of, uh, which my generation have uh, lived through. And I've been lucky enough uh, to be involved uh, quite uh, directly uh, in the very machine room of these uh, two transformations, which is why they are, in my view, uh, connected with one another. Both of these transformations, which indeed have been uh, the uh, brand of our times, at least uh, for a few decades, are uh, now uh, under scrutiny, if not uh, outrightly rejected uh, by some, uh, at least in the West. And I think we uh, need to understand uh, why and what this means uh, for the future. So that's what they have in common. Uh, there is, of course, uh, a major difference uh, between EU integration and globalization. Uh, you can uh, step down from the EU train at some cost, I believe, but I may be wrong. Uh, but you can't step down from the train of globalization. And that's a major difference. And in these circumstances, uh, my main point, which I will uh, develop uh, tonight with you, uh, is that uh, given that you cannot step down from the train of globalization, uh, the only option uh, you are left with, at least for those who have issues with globalization, and I have issues with globalization, uh, is to harness it uh, in order uh, to move it in the direction which uh, we believe is right. For those of us who believe that it doesn't naturally lead in the right direction. And this is where uh, you're taken back to European integration, uh, because I think that for us, being a French, I think I would say the same if I was a German or an Italian or a Spaniard. Uh, European integration is the only tool we have to try and move globalization in the direction uh, we want. But let's first uh, look at the, this issue, uh, whether or not uh, we still have to look at the future with globalization in mind. Uh, and, of course, whether uh, it's or not uh, faltering. Now, there are some uh, signals, uh, rumors, interpretation, uh, sort of the market of ideas. Uh, you can find traces of uh, this notion that globalization uh, is not only uh, faltering, but halting or even moving backwards. There is a bit of that in uh, economics. And assuming globalization is what you rightly said, I believe it is, which is a historical uh, phase of uh, uh, the expansion of market capitalism. And we've had other in uh, preceding times, and we probably will have others in uh, coming times. True, if you look at the numbers, and the numbers are 
Uh, trade numbers are probably the best approximation of uh, the speed, uh, the force of globalization. I mean, trade numbers, which is international trade measured in volumes. Uh, there are traces that uh, the uh, speed of growth of international trade measured in volume is not what it used to be uh, 10 or 15 years ago. In other words, the ratio uh, between uh, the growth of trade volumes and the growth of uh, GNPs, which is peers and apples, GNPs being a sum of value addition, trade volumes being a sum of trade flows, and if trade crisscrosses several borders, in the, in the case of a global value supply chain of cars, for instance, uh, you can have a huge volume of trade for the same car because things, uh, spare parts, uh, which are assembled here or there, uh, increase the volume of international trade. So by this standard, by this measure, there are signs that the acceleration of globalization understood as interpenetration of uh, production of goods and services, which you can also measure in measuring the import content of exports. All these numbers tell us that we are probably at a stage where the speed which we've had is not there anymore, so it's uh, slowing. There are also uh, obvious uh, cultural signs uh, and I think the U.S. election uh, can be uh, taken as an example of that, uh, that the speed, the force of past decades of globalization uh, has led to a sort of cultural backlash. Uh, what uh, Pankaj Mishra uh, called uh, the sort of that's the title of his latest book, uh, The Age of Anger. Uh, a sort of a mutiny against uh, modernizing uh, elites, uh, which uh, triggers uh, nativist, uh, illiberal uh, reactions, including uh, uh, on the, the form of uh, uh, religious fundamentalism. So there is a sort of new problem of uh, us versus uh, them, uh, which uh, finds a clear expression uh, in what happened in the US with what happens if you look at the growing uh, support uh, that uh, these so-called populist movements uh, receive in uh, Europe. Uh, and I put populist in brackets. It's a word I do not like to use uh, because I think using it is in a way recognizing uh, that uh, the people uh, are with them, uh, which I don't. Uh, but let's agree that there is a sign of that, uh, at least, again, in the Western uh, Hemisphere. Although uh, what happened in, uh, recently in the Philippines or in uh, Turkey or even in India uh, could be uh, interpreted uh, in the same manner. Now, there are signs in the economic side, in the cultural side. There are signs also in the difficulty uh, in uh, global uh, governance of this previous very high-speed globalization, uh, as we've seen, for instance, in the uh, stalling of the uh, Doha uh, development agenda. Assuming uh, the World Trade Organization is one of the prime uh, governors of uh, globalization because it is the prime governor of international trade. Obviously, the fact that from 2008 on until now, <coughs> this agenda hasn't moved, although other uh, treaties or uh, trade opening agreements uh, have moved forward, is a sign of globalization having a problem uh, in terms of its uh, governance. So, there are signals. But there are also uh, signals uh, in uh, another direction, 
uh, from which uh, one would uh, consider uh, that uh, the illusion, uh, as uh, said uh, Mark Twain, uh, the report of uh, degradations are probably uh, greatly exaggerated. Uh, and that's also stemmed from the observation of economics, uh, uh, cultural uh, reactions, uh, mood of times, or even uh, global governance. If you look at uh, economics, and if you assume, which is my case, that the main engine of globalization uh, is uh, technological uh, progress, uh, which itself stems for a large part, not the total part, but a large part from uh, science, uh, the odds are that globalization will keep going on. And the main reason why globalization will keep going on is that the capacity of technology to crush the cost of distance, which was what limited uh, globalization uh, during a long time, uh, is, uh, still has a lot of uh, potential. Uh, so, uh, brace for more of this international uh, division of labor. It sometimes will reach a plateau, as it probably does uh, for the moment, but assuming relative prices start changing for whatever reason, for instance, if uh, one day we would have a, a price for a <coughs> CO2, then uh, the uh, shape of globalization uh, will change, but it still will be globalization in uh, different circumstances. The global supply chains will keep expanding, uh, not least because a large part of what now is exchanged uh, and which is not measured uh, by uh, volumes of trade uh, is uh, data. A lot of what now is used to create value uh, is not accounted in any statistic of international trade. And that, of course, uh, creates a, a measuring issue which uh, uh, we uh, economists uh, have known for a long time. Uh, it's not that we don't have a theory of how the thing works, <laughs> that we can't measure it, at least for the moment, because we haven't put our observation uh, in the right place. So, I personally believe that this sort of interconnection, which creates interdependence uh, will uh, keep uh, growing, notably in the uh, digital uh, age. Uh, this is uh, also partly true in areas like cultures, like imagination, uh, like uh, mind uh, projections or concepts. If uh, you consider, for instance, uh, the growing role of, uh, of NGOs, uh, in public perceptions and the framing of public attitudes uh, in this world. Uh, if you take issues like um, hunger or corruption or environment, there is a very large convergence all over this planet and stemming from systems of thought, tradition, spirituality, culture, very different, uh, there is a huge process of convergence on a number of these uh, issues. And by the way, part of this convergence uh, is uh, triggered uh, by this uh, infrastructure. I'm not 100% Marxist, but enough to believe that infrastructure still matter. Uh, if you look at the way, for instance, uh, the expansion of trade leads to a necessity uh, to agree uh, on uh, animal welfare standards, uh, which is maybe not the first priority I would have for a global culture. I mean, why start with animal welfare standards? Well, it has to start with animal welfare standards because meat is traded. And the moment comparative advantage uh, works, uh, the way it works now, uh, it becomes an issue of major importance. When I was DG of WTO, I had avoided at the last minute, uh, 
uh, a litigation between uh, Australia and uh, Indonesia uh, at a time where animal welfare activists in Australia uh, pressed the government to ban the export of live cattle to Indonesia because they were slaughtered halal, uh, which was a terrible thing for them. Now, one would normally react in saying, well, aren't human rights a priority as compared to animal welfare standards? Certainly, on the moral point of view, but the reality is the way the, work, the world works and the way globalization expands leads to this sort of convergence, which probably uh, would not have been intellectually uh, the first thing to do. As far as uh, signals on uh, governance are concerned, uh, true, in some cases uh, there has been uh, pitfalls or failures in recent time, uh, we've also had reasonable successes. Uh, COP21 uh, was uh, certainly uh, a moment where global governance worked after uh, many, many years of uh, uh, failures and, and probably a bit late as compared to <coughs> some of our ambitions, but the G20 uh, has done reasonably good work on uh, taxation of uh, multinationals. I mean, not that we are there yet, at least in my view, but there, something is happening which never happened before, and it's an area where, as you know, uh, vested interests are uh, extremely strong. And one of the reasons why uh, this uh, global governance uh, may be moving forward in some areas is probably that uh, because of globalization, uh, what previously was in the hands of uh, sovereign animals, sovereign uh, Westphalian's uh, animal, as per uh, the uh, Peace of uh, Westphalia uh, 1648, which had until now the monopoly of international relations, of global governance, are losing this monopoly. Uh, which now uh, falls uh, probably a bit more in the hands of uh, non-state actors. And I'm thinking of uh, cities, for instance. When you look at the role major cities on this planet played to prepare the COP21 and their presence at the event itself, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, pretty clear. Of course, NGOs. Of course, multinationals, some of them uh, now understand that as uh, stakeholders of this uh, globalization process, uh, they have to take their own responsibilities uh, in uh, engaging. And those of us who uh, attended uh, COP21, uh, I mean, cannot not have noticed that uh, there were three big wide pavilions uh, like, uh, you know, like an expo. Uh, one was for states, and they had their logo and their name, Japan, blah, blah, blah. Another one was for NGOs. It was the same setting. It was another hall, the same setting. And the names had roughly uh, the same uh, characters. And the third one was uh, with multinationals. You had uh, General Electric and uh, Philips and uh, Alibaba. In, uh, in the same hall with roughly uh, the, same, uh, the same name tags as the ones you found in the... So that was visually extremely striking. And I, I think uh, this is uh, moving forward in what I call uh, polygovernance, as opposed to multi-governance, which was the traditional uh, system. So bit of signals on the one side, but also other signals on the other side, uh, which lead me to believe that uh, globalization is here to say. Now, what does this uh, mean uh, for the time uh, to come? And I will conclude in, of course, in mentioning Brexit. Uh, what does this mean? It means that we will have to keep uh, coping uh, with uh, uh, globalization as a force, uh, with its good sides and its bad sides. 
uh, like often said, and written uh, that uh, this is uh, Janus. Uh, you've got uh, two faces, uh, one uh, smiling and one uh, grimacing. The good side is poverty reduction. The good side is creating interdependences, creating links, uh, which uh, the, the distension of which is uh, costly. And this is a reality, especially if you look at you know, the map of the world, uh, and if you look at uh, uh, where zones of hardship, conflict, uh, tensions, wars are, they usually are the places of this planet which have remained outside of globalization. Uh, when I was a DG of WTO, I often uh, discussed with a very good friend of mine who now has become uh, Secretary of the UN, uh, Antonio Guterres, and we would look at our respective maps. Uh, I would have my map of the world with where I have members and where I don't have members. He would look at his map of the world where he had most of his clients, refugees, uh, asylum seekers, displaced population, and where I had most of my non-clients was in an arch between Afghanistan, Iran, Syria, Iraq, and the eastern uh, corn of, uh, Horn of Africa, plus North Korea, Algeria, a bit outside of the zone. That's where I had 80% of my non-members. And that's where he had 80% of his clients. So that says something about this uh, relationship. So there are good sides in globalization. There are also, as we know, less good sides, uh, which is that while globalization has reduced poverty and created some uh, stability, uh, it has also uh, increased uh, inequalities. There's a big debate uh, whether this is forever, whether this is intrinsically linked uh, to the way market capitalism works. Others would say it's a transition period, a bit like in the 19th century, to which the reply would be, yeah, yeah, but in the 19th century, uh, it only was harnessed and domesticated because of social movements that then took a bit of control of the situation. Uh, the reality being that if globalization works, and it does, in my view, uh, it is uh, because it is painful. So, globalization works to create economic efficiencies, which is a potential for welfare. Economic efficiencies are not automatically welfare. They are a potential for welfare. But this, of course, uh, needs a series of conditions, which is, by the way, the reason why uh, when I wrote... Uh, this, uh, when I recovered my freedom of speech, uh, leaving uh, WTO in 2013, uh, I published this book, which the title of which is The Geneva Consensus, as opposed to the Washington Consensus, the Washington Consensus being roughly, you open, you liberalize, and uh, God will take care of the rest. Uh, the Geneva Consensus being, you open, uh, uh, but you have to observe a series of conditions for this trade opening efficiencies to translate uh, into welfare. And that's, in my view, to be easily understood. What Mr. Uh, Ricardo and Mr. Schumpeter theorized at the time uh, was that uh, comparative advantage would work. If I do something better than you do, and you do something better than I do, we have a rational interest uh, to trade and exchange. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, the people uh, with me who are producing what you do better than them won't be that happy. Uh, they will suffer a competitive uh, shock, uh, which is uh, where Mr. Schumpeter uh, comes in. And, of course, the weakest in my troop will be hit by this, as the weakest in your troops uh, will be hit uh, by uh, my comparative advantage. And this 
is the reason why you need this efficiency creation uh, to be, at least in my view, uh, matched with proper social systems, uh, which is uh, where I still am uh, after a number of years uh, in uh, engagement and uh, running uh, such uh, processes. That's <coughs> roughly how I see the problem. Uh, the difficulty, of course, uh, being that uh, this process of globalization, by definition, with this uh, technological engine, uh, is a global one, uh, whereas uh, what you have to do in order to harness it is mostly of a local nature. Most of what you have to do in order to harness globalization uh, relies on redistribution, uh, solidarity in one way or another, and solidarity is inevitably something much more local. I will accept uh, to pay for uh, people who belong uh, to the same uh, community as I do for a variety of reasons, but I have a limited sense of belonging. At some stage, I'm not going to accept, uh, which is why uh, this interaction uh, between uh, politics and uh, economics is, uh, becomes uh, so crucial. And it's understandable that the moment you rely on solidarity, uh, more or less, and we can uh, detail this, but the moment you rely on solidarity, uh, you have an accountability issue. And accountability is something that goes with local. There is a lot of local accountability, and inevitably, and this is probably will not change uh, before a long time, a, a very limited uh, global accountability. So that's the issue we have to uh, strive with uh, in this uh, complex articulation. Uh, as far as culture is concerned, uh, I think uh, we also have to invent uh, something uh, that uh, is different from a sort of a cosmopolitan identity. I don't think there is something like a cosmopolitan identity, or at least there is nothing like a cosmopolitan identity that would, would substitute other identities. And I think the way forward on this, and that's what I have observed, including through my uh, trained lens, uh, is that the way forward is uh, to articulate different uh, levels of uh, identity, uh, which is uh, perfectly possible if uh, you look, for instance, at uh, federal uh, systems. And this takes back, uh, before I uh, conclude, uh, this uh, takes us back uh, to this uh, European question. Uh, and in many ways, uh, I mean, the European integration process uh, is uh, key to this issue. A, because it is about economic integration and political integration. B, because in this cultural sphere, we have uh, things in common, uh, which, uh, in terms of uh, values, uh, which uh, probably uh, bind us together in a uh, specific way. Now, not that the dream of the Founding Fathers, uh, which was that uh, economic integration uh, would by itself produce political integration, has worked. I think after 60 years uh, of uh, uh, celebrating the uh, Treaty of uh, Rome uh, this month, after 60 years, we know that this belief they had, my boss had when I was uh, with Delors, I had, including when I was a EU commissioner, that forging economic integration would, by whatever alchemistry miracle, lead to forging political uh, union. Uh, we have to know it doesn't work this way. I'm not saying it doesn't work at all but it doesn't work this way. There is something more uh, that needs uh, to uh, intervene, 
so that uh, this uh, chemistry uh, works. And the something more, in my view, is in the area of uh, values, of beliefs, of uh, concepts, of imagination, of uh, symbols, of uh, narratives. Uh, and that's something, in a way, I realized much more clearly uh, when I left uh, Brussels, uh, Strasbourg, and Luxembourg <laughs> uh, to join uh, Geneva at the WTO, uh, where I had the occasion during many years to observe EU from outside with the eyes of non-Europeans. And this is a fantastic experience, because what you quite rapidly realize is that what European identity is about is much clearer in the eyes of non-Europeans than it is in the eyes of Europeans. Uh, if you ask an average uh, Chinese or Brazilian <coughs> or Nigerian or uh, Indonesian, what's Europe about? What, what's the definition? They will probably give you a rather clear definition. I mean, the shortest probably being uh, it's a place where it's nice to live. That's, that's, that's a very short one. And I think it still remains uh, the very short one, although some are starting to have a few doubts, uh, given the relatively low level of economic and social performance of uh, the EU for the last uh, 10 years. If you dig a bit more, people will tell you it's a place where there is a sort of specific mix of balance between uh, individual freedom, uh, collective social security systems. It's a place where people are less uh, intolerant to inequalities than uh, in other places. It's a place where environment sensitivity is uh, higher. It's a place where access to culture is more widespread uh, in the population, uh, especially uh, depending on your level of resources. So there is something like a European civilization model, uh, which is I believe, what needs to be realized a bit more in the future than it has been in the past. I mean, Jean Monnet never said uh, what he was uh, said to have said, uh, which is, uh, if I had to restart, I would restart with sculpture. Uh, he never said that. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's that's proper sort of way forward. But there is something true in the fact that uh, in between uh, this uh, uh, economic integration and this political integration, you need this glue, uh, which is about values. And that leads me uh, naturally to my uh, conclusion, which is that, of course, if uh, EU, if Europe is about values, UK is part of that. There is no way you could if you look at European identity this way, distinguish uh, the uh, EU uh, omelette uh, on the one side and the UK egg on the other hand, which is the whole problem of Brexit, uh, which is getting this egg out of the omelette, uh, which is a, a very uh, complex uh, issue. Uh, and this is the big question mark for people uh, like me. And I'm working uh, quite a lot on trying both to understand uh, and to think of a Brexit something that would uh, limit uh, what I believe are damages uh, for us all. Going back to my introduction, I believe that long term globalization remains a process where uh, economics uh, will at the end of the day uh, trump politics, as they've done it for the last 30, 40 years, not obviously uh, in a very convincing way for the last uh, two or three years, but long term, I think the fundamental reasons remain there. Uh, on, uh, uh, on Brexit, uh, I think uh, only time uh, will tell uh, whether what uh, happened <coughs> last June, and which in my view, again, not objective at all, uh, but which in my view is a moment where uh, politics uh, trumped economics. Uh, whether uh, this will be the case uh, 
three years, five years, eight years, uh, ten years from now. I don't know, uh, and I'll be looking at that extremely carefully, not least because for us, remaining the continental EU27, uh, the Brexit is also a test case. The fundamental uh, ideological fuel of European integration uh, is that uh, we will do better uh, together than single. What's at stake uh, with the Brexit is exactly this experience. We have to take it as it is. After all, most of us would not have wished it uh, to happen, at least on the continent, uh, which is where we probably differ from uh, the British uh, public. Uh, but this experience is going to have a huge impact on the UK, of course, but it will also have a huge impact on the EU, notably when uh, the jury will be uh, there 10 years from now, not before, in my view, will tell you whether it's a good choice or not. Thanks for your attention.